Okay, so systemic lupus erythematosus, or just plain lupus, is uh, a very, very, very typical autoimmune disease. This is the characteristic autoimmune disease. So uh, this is sort of a difficult one to diagnose, but generally the USMLE will make it uh, pretty straightforward for you. But let's look over some of the basics. So systemic lupus erythematosus is a chronic inflammatory multisystemic disease. And arthritis is one of a myriad of possible symptoms and presentations. So what I want you to get from that is that arthritis is kind of just part of the cast here. There's a ton of other symptoms that lupus can present with or that can be accompanied uh, with, with the patient with lupus. So uh, you don't necessarily have arthritis as the presenting complaint, as opposed to say osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, septic arthritis, um, gout, pseudogout, uh, and so forth. It's relatively rare, uh, but it's common enough to, to warrant our attention. Approximate, uh, approximately 250,000 people are affected in the U.S. and blacks and Hispanics are affected more than whites. Women are affected more than men by 9 to 1 ratio. So this is primarily a female disorder. The reason that it develops is considered to be part genetics, part environmental, but it's really idiopathic. We don't know exactly what causes it at this point. We do know, however, that it is uh, an autoimmune disorder. The classic triad that this presents with, uh, that you'll see with lupus, is fever, arthralgia, or arthritis, and a rash. So that's how the USMLE is going to generally characterize it. They may also include uh, in place or in addition to one of these symptoms, uh, pleurisy or pleuritis, or uh, they may uh, include uh, pericarditis. So the classic triad though is fever, arthralgia, and rash. And that rash can be one of, uh, usually, it's, usually it's the malar rash, but it can be also a discoid rash or a photosensitive rash. And we'll see some pictures of what those look like. Ultimately, lupus is diagnosed based on a set of criteria that the American College of Rheumatology has approved, and it's supported by laboratory evidence, but there's no one single way to diagnose this. It's not like you can get a, a, uh, a single laboratory examination or a, uh, an x-ray or a CT. This is a diagnosis based on criteria, kind of like some of the psychiatric disorders, but this is clearly not a psychiatric disorder. Okay, so this is the Malar rash. So lupus is named after uh, the Latin word for wolf, and uh, wolves actually have this kind of distribution of coloring if you look at them. Uh, so I guess that's why they called it lupus. But uh, so the Malar rash is just uh, kind of covers the face uh, underneath the eyes and over the bridge of the nose. So you can see it's a very uh, conserved distribution in all of these women, even though. Uh, there's different levels of severity. The rash can look a little different. This is, it's the same pattern in all of these women. Okay, and then there's the discoid rash. So I want to emphasize right here that there's systemic lupus erythematosus and then there's discoid lupus. These are two separate entities. They tend to be treated the same way, but they're two separate entities. Discoid lupus is not quite as severe, and the rash is what helps us distinguish the two. So discoid lupus, only about 15% of patients with discoid lupus will go on to develop systemic lupus. But discoid lupus is primarily a disease of the skin. So uh, I want to differentiate between the two. It's the rash that sets them apart, uh, but they're similar but different entities. So discoid lupus is a different rash in that it can occur anywhere on the body, and it tends to be these ovoid-like plaques. And so uh, sometimes they have this, uh, this sort of uh, central clearing, uh, kind of like what you would see in, uh, in, in Lyme's disease, maybe, for instance. Uh, but 
there's almost always this plaque like uh, skin uh, condition in the middle so you get this sort of white this whiteness and I'll show you some other pictures um, so here, here's another one uh, there are various different sizes and um, and so what what really uh, you should look at though is is the um, is the shape uh, it's the shape and um, and then the uh, the other symptoms of lupus. And this is the singer Seal, and he has discoid lupus. And these are clearly uh, um, scars from from the uh, from the discoid rash. Uh, the discoid rash can be anywhere on the body, but it tends to have a predilection to occur on that same part of the body that uh, the malar rash occurs on. Okay, so. The rash alone cannot diagnose lupus, particularly the discoid rash, because the discoid rash, since it can occur on any part of the body and that rash looks like a lot of different things, you can't diagnose it just based on the rash alone. Of course, that malar rash is very specific being in that part of the body, but I just want to emphasize that you can't, you can't diagnose this based on rash alone. So the manifestations of lupus, there are tremendous amounts of uh, ways that lupus can manifest itself or that it can express itself, but I bold-faced the ones that are the most important to know, but really all of these are good ones to know because any patient with lupus can start to develop these particular symptoms. So um, arthralgia and arthritis are part of the triad. Myalgias are possible. By the way, the arthritis will usually be symmetrical and polyarticular, so similar to RA. Avascular necrosis is more of a complication of lupus rather than a uh, rather than a presentation, and that will of course tend to occur at the femoral head just because of that sort of tedious vasculature around there. Uh, the dermatologic manifestations, those are, of course, important to know because those tend to be how it presents. Oral ulcers are another thing that uh, are complication or presentation of lupus. Renal symptoms are important with lupus because that's a common uh, sort of end stage with lupus. The, the kidneys will, will die off. Uh, neuropsychiatric conditions uh, such as confusion, seizures, and psychosis can be complications of lupus. Uh, pleuritis is a good one to know that's associated with lupus, uh, and then pericarditis. As far as hematological uh, effects, you can get the anemia of chronic disease, that would probably be in the majority of patients, I would say. Um, and then thrombocytopenia or leukopenia. So really a, a, a drop in any of, the, uh, any of the blood counts. One that's really good to know and that the USMLE likes to throw up there is the woman who has maybe a couple lupus symptoms, but she's got this history of unsuccessful pregnancies. About 75% of pregnancies in women who have lupus, either diagnosed or undiagnosed, wind up in spontaneous abortions. So that's good to know that if a woman has spontaneous abortions, then that's, that points you towards lupus. So I wouldn't necessarily memorize all of these, but uh, just sort of be aware that these are, are uh, conditions that lupus can be associated with. What I would try to memorize and put it into a, this isn't my mnemonic, I, I got this online, but uh, these, this is the actual diagnostic criteria for SLE. So this is kind of whittled down, um, but this is the American College of Rheumatology uh, uh, criteria for lupus. So serositis is an inflammation of any serous lining, oral ulcers, arthritis, photosensitivity, and the rash that comes with photosensitivity tends to be maculopapular, but it'll be basically a sunburn. So you're getting a sunburn, but it's a maculopapular rash rather than just the, the sort of typical sunburn that, that a normal person would get. And so then blood disorders, so thrombocytopenia, anemia, chronic disease, uh, low white cells, Renal abnormalities, so elevation in creatinine, uh, ANA positive, immunological phenomenon such as anti-SMIF and anti-DSDNA 
antibodies. These will tend to be something that you're going to check in a patient that you're suspecting lupus. So this really isn't going to be on your checklist when you're, when you're uh, screening for lupus. Neurologic symptoms that aren't otherwise explained. So if a patient has epilepsy, uh, then that can count uh, on this diagnostic criteria. And then, of course, the Malar rash or the discoid rash. And so if they have four of these, then it's 95% specific and 85% sensitive for lupus. Now, what if they only have two of these or three of these? Then at that point, you're actually definitely going to get the ANA because the ANA tends to come back positive in people who may only have three of these. And so then that ANA will be your fourth diagnosis. Even if they have two, you can get the ANA and that would be uh, three if it comes back positive, and then you can get your anti-SMIF and anti-DS DNA, and that would be your fourth right there. So we'll see, we'll see that come up in how we diagnose lupus formally. Okay, so how do we see lupus presented? So the history tends to be a younger female. Often she's of color, Hispanic, Native American, uh, black, presenting with a facial rash and or joint pain. That, those tend to be the two most common, and this is just based on my experience with seeing thousands of USMLE questions. Uh, facial rash and joint pain tend to be the most common uh, ones that they put up on, uh, on questions. But remember the triad of rash, joint pain, and fever. Um, rash and joint pain would be two of the, uh, of the criteria. So you got two right there. Definitely be sure to get an OB history. And I'm, you know, I'm kind of tailoring this too to real life. You know, if you have a woman with facial rash and joint pain, get an OB history on her, um, looking for those spontaneous abortions. Of course, the symptoms, fever, rash, and arthralgia and arthritis. Diagnosis. So if you are suspecting SLE, uh, and depending on how the question is formed, if it's saying which of the following is the best initial diagnostic step in this patient, or which of the following is the best next step in the management of this patient. If you're suspecting SLE, assuming that the patient is otherwise stable and that you don't need to take care of anything else at that point in time, so this is assuming she's not coughing up blood, this is assuming she's not uh, got a 104 degree fever and you might think she's got an infection. This is assuming she doesn't have such severe joint pain that you're going to give her uh, an NSAID to treat the joint pain first. Assuming that the patient is otherwise stable, the best initial diagnostic test is an ANA. ANA is anti-nuclear antibody. And when this comes back, if it's positive, this will help us check off another on the uh, on on our uh, cr diagnostic criteria. Now, this is a screening. ANA is not the most accurate test for lupus, so there are going to be a lot of people that come back positive for ANA that don't have lupus. But there are very few people who have lupus who don't have a positive ANA. So this is a very sensitive test, but it's not specific. So. Any patient that comes back ANA positive, you're going to get an anti-DS DNA and an anti-SMIF antibody serology. And these are more specific. And a lot of patients with lupus will have these positive as well. And if these come back positive, then that's another criteria you can check off. And of course, four diagnostic criteria will satisfy the diagnosis. So SOAP Brain MD is how you remember the diagnostic criteria, all 11 of them. Okay, so how do we treat lupus? Now, for the USMLE, you just really need to know the basics. You just need to know this at a superficial level because in real life, lupus is managed and treated by a rheumatologist. So the general practitioner is not going to be in the depths of treating lupus. Uh, if you're on the wards, uh, internal medicine, or surgery or whatnot, you're not going to be the one treating the lupus. You're going to have consult on that. Uh, but you should know the basics of how lupus is treated on an outpatient basis. So what we do for lupus is we control the symptoms. Because there's no cure, we generally are just trying to keep this patient healthy and happy. So for the arthritis and in all the, any of the general inflammation, so the oral ulcers, the arthritis, 
uh, serositis, the pleuritis, we give NSAIDs. These are anti-inflammatories, and so they work directly against the pathology behind those. So uh, for the arthritis symptoms, we give ibuprofen, ketorolax, uh, meloxicam, etc. For the rash, these can be treated with just regular old corticosteroid ointments, like betamethasone. Another good thing, uh, and this isn't probably going to come up in the USMLE because USMLE doesn't really focus on preventative care, but for your patients, if you have a patient with lupus, good to know that sunscreen is good because uh, UV exposure causes that uh, photosensitive rash. So that's uh, something that you know I had, to, I had to put in here for completion's sake. Now, when a patient has symptoms that are more frequent uh, and the NSAIDs and topical ointment are not sufficient, then we can add oral corticosteroids and we can add uh, hydroxychloroquine for increased efficacy. So this is sort of a step up. The patient's lupus is a little bit more severe and we kind of want to go at it with another line. Um, of course, oral corticosteroids have the adverse effect of uh, weight gain and, uh, and uh, uh, any of the symptoms that you would see in, in, uh, in a patient that's uh, hyperalbuminemic. Uh, hydroxychloroquine would uh, be associated with retinitis. And so, again, these are why we want to avoid these drugs. But if we have to use them, then we certainly do. Now, in patients that have severe lupus, and by severe lupus, I mean patients that have uh, renal failure, if they've got any heart, lung, or CNS manifestations, then they should be added, in addition to all of the above, they should be started on uh, cytotoxics. And those are like azathioprine and cyclophosphamide. Uh, mycophenolate could also be included in that. Now, in emergent cases, so emergent cases would be acute flares, uh, and this is usually manifested as rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, so a patient that is clearly um, going to be needing dialysis. Patients who have, uh, can, that are diagnosed with lupus who have acute confusion or seizures, uh, or patients that have severe TTP, these patients should be put on IV corticosteroids and cytotoxics. And this is just for their acute flare. So it's not permanent, but it's for their inpatient therapy. And you can uh, also consider IVIG. But this is sort of getting a little bit deeper into the treatment. And another thing I want to add here is that any patient diagnosed with uh, systemic lupus uh, that has a fever should be treated as an inpatient because you don't know if it's lupus or if it's an infection. And since patients with lupus can have low uh, white, white counts, uh, they are at risk for infection. And in addition to the fact that they may be taking prednisone and uh, cytotoxics and so forth. So uh, you, you should be aware that patients that have lupus, that have a fever, they should be treated on an inpatient basis, and uh, you should be looking for a possible source of infection. Rule that out. There is one biologic that's approved for use in lupus, and so you should be aware of this for the USMLE because it is approved, and that's bilimumab. But uh, again, this is something that you are not going to prescribe as an internist or as a surgeon or as a resident. This is something that only a rheumatologist would write out for. So good to be aware of, but primarily what I would be aware of is the maintenance therapy for lupus, the fact that uh, you could use oral steroids and hydroxychloroquine, and then for flares that you would want to use IV corticosteroids and cytotoxics. Okay, so what about pregnancy and SLE? So there's always the talk of pregnancy with lupus, and the reason is because, well, first off, lupus is a disease that primarily affects women, and it affects younger women, and younger women get pregnant as part of life. So uh, women with lupus have a high risk of spontaneous abortion, so you can see how all of this uh, with lupus and pregnancy are kind of mesh into each other. So why do women with lupus have spontaneous abortion? The theory behind it is because they have some of these circulating antibodies uh, 
what can happen is that they can coagulate and they can cause uh, a, a an infarct in the placenta. And so when you get an infarct in the placenta, the baby ultimately dies of, of hypoxia, and so then you get uh, spontaneous abortion. This will usually happen pretty early on in the pregnancy. Uh, now, if a woman is, if she has lupus, if she's been diagnosed with lupus, and she is diagnosed with pregnancy, I hate to make it sound like it's a disease, but if she, if she is pregnant and she has lupus, she should be screened for the anti-Rho antibody. Now, remember, what are the antibodies that we associate with lupus? ANA, because it's so common, and then anti-Smith and anti-DSDNA, because it's so specific. There are a ton, in reality, though, of, of antibodies that can be present with lupus, and that's why there's so many different uh, there's so many different systemic effects. It can affect so many different systems. And so anti-Rho is another one of those antibodies that come around in lupus. And women who have the anti-Rho antibody uh, have a risk of giving birth to babies who will have neonatal lupus. So all pregnant women during their pregnancy should be screened for anti-Rho antibody. And that's part of taking care of the baby because if a woman has anti-Rho positive, then we want to know that so that neonatology is standing by when this baby is born because this baby is at risk for a complete heart block. So not all babies who are born to anti rho positive mothers will have neonatal lupus, but they're at an increased risk, and so we want to make sure we are all ready. So all pregnant women should be screened during pregnancy for anti rho antibody. As far as her treatment during pregnancy for her lupus, all drugs should be stopped during the first trimester. None of the drugs that are given for lupus are safe during the first trimester, so she should be she should be off all meds during the first trimester. After the first trimester, she should be started on low molecular weight heparin and aspirin. And that's not really to help her lupus, that's to prevent uh, a adverse pregnancy outcome. I will add, I didn't type it in on here, but I'll add that uh, women with lupus are also at risk for uh, preeclampsia, at a much higher risk. Okay, so neonatal lupus. So we kind of talked about this. So this is, occurs to babies that are born to mothers with lupus, particularly mothers that are anti rho positive. And the most common presentation is uh, a malar or discoid rash and, of course, the complete heart block. So the complete heart block, of course, is much more, uh, much more important. So we want to have neonatology, uh, neonatal surgeons, pediatric surgeons already uh, when this baby's delivered. So the treatment for neonatal lupus involves surgical implantation of a pacing device. Remember that uh, complete heart block requires a pacing device in anybody, not just babies, but anybody with a complete heart block is going to be indicated for a pacemaker. And then for the first six to eight months, just symptomatic control. And that's generally going to be with hydroxychloroquine or with uh, topical st steroids, depending on the severity. And see this baby here has a discoid distribution of lupus, and uh, you would just treat these sores with, uh, with uh, IV or with topical steroids. But of course, if there are systemic symptoms, then you can go ahead and use IV steroids as you would in any patient with lupus, depending on the severity. But what you should know as far as neonatal lupus is that they are at risk for complete heart block, and so they're going to need a pacing device. Um, and then from there on, you treat it the same way you would treat it in anybody with lupus. But these antibodies will resolve out of their blood by six to eight months of age. So this is something that goes away. So the baby won't live with this for the rest of their life. It's not a congenital illness. Um, NSAIDs should be avoided in all babies uh, because it uh, increases their risk of crinicterus. So don't use NSAIDs in babies. Okay, and then the last thing that I want to talk about is drug-induced lupus. So this is a totally different manifestation. This is not lupus at all. So the fact that it's called drug-induced lupus is just because it kind of looks like lupus, but it's not lupus at all. So this is a lupus-like syndrome, uh, and 
being lupus-like, it has the symptoms of fever, arthritis, fatigue, and sometimes pleurisy. But there are major differences that differentiate it from lupus. First off, the patient is on a drug that causes the drug-induced lupus. And I put that down here as number three, but really that's kind of number one. The patient is on a drug that can cause drug-induced lupus, and I'll talk about what those are. And then symptom-wise, patients with drug-induced lupus are going to lack the skin manifestations. And that's kind of the most striking thing, because when you think lupus, you think of that malar rash. And that doesn't happen in patients with drug-induced lupus. They also will lack renal manifestation, so their creatinine will be fine. Uh, so drug-induced lupus is basically fever, arthritis, fatigue that occurs in a patient that's taking a drug. And those drugs that are associated with drug-induced lupus, there's four of them that are most commonly associated, and that's hydralazine, which is generally given to reduce blood pressure, isoniazid, which is uh, an anti-TB drug, procainamide and quinidine, which are both uh, antiarrhythmics, and then some of the anti-epileptic drugs, uh, most notably uh, phenytoin. So if you want to test for drug-induced lupus, you can actually test for drug-induced lupus. Um, and the most accurate test for drug-induced lupus is an antihistone antibody. The antihistone antibody uh, will be diagnostic for drug-induced lupus when it's present with, with these symptoms. But it's not always present in patients with drug-induced lupus. But the most accurate test for uh, drug-induced lupus is antihistone antibody. It's specific. Uh, the treatment, of course, is just to uh, stop the offending drug. Uh, definitely know these four. Hydralazine, isoniazid, procainamide, and quinidine. And uh, know that patients with drug-induced lupus lack skin and renal manifestations. If a patient has a malar rash, it's not drug-induced lupus. And that's it.